As director, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of the 10th anniversary for the Center on Diversity and Community. <laughs> Kodak, as we are better known, began 10 years ago as a kernel of an idea. We needed a place that could provide proactive and research-based advice about diversity issues emerging on our campus. Advice on how to create inclusive learning environments, how to effectively connect with students from diverse backgrounds, and how to respond effectively when conversations go sideways. Like many good ideas, that kernel sprouted, grew, and flourished through the work of dedicated people, many of whom are here today. Over time, Kodak became a valuable sounding board for faculty, administrators, and graduate students teaching for the first time. Informal sessions gradually evolved into Kodak workshops and professional development institutes, focused on negotiating as well as maximizing the complexity that accompanies greater cultural diversity. Especially in classes that directly address such hot button issues as race, sexuality, and inequality, to name just a few, dialogues are often emotionally charged. But even in classes that are not ostensibly about these subjects, they often come up anyway and push faculty in, into unfamiliar and risky territory. We may be experts in our subject matter, but few of us are experts in facilitating charged conversations. And this is where Kodak found its niche. I'd like to take a few moments to uh, just talk about the theme for our anniversary celebration, which is unscripting diversity, celebrating 10 years of engaging challenge and building community. Some of you may be wondering, so what does unscripting diversity even mean, and what does it entail? In short, when it comes to diversity, we've grown accustomed to dialogues that work along with the expected, scripts that keep us supposedly safe. Safe from what, you might ask? Perhaps from offending others, creating controversy, or being seen as a racist, or a homophobic, or a sexist, or maybe even from litigation. But a price is paid for this supposed safety. And part of that price is a shallow, hollow quality to many conversations. I imagine you know what I mean and can readily flash upon a recent experience where wooden smiles and stilted dialogue filled in for authentic connection and exchange. And that's where this idea of unscripting diversity comes, comes in. If we want to move discussions of diversity beyond the superficial, beyond demographics and stereotypes, we have to take a risk and learn to go off script. Because the truth is that many of our scripts are outdated and don't serve us very well, if they ever did. Now, please don't get me wrong. The potential for conflict and misunderstanding is real in any cross-cultural interaction. And going off script means stepping outside of our comfort zones. Still, we believe that it is necessary and it's worth it. We all need to be smarter about diversity. And we need to educate ourselves, our students, and our children to successfully function across cultures. This lies at the core of unscripting diversity, but it must be done with an ethic of care. That ethic of care is what informs how we go off script. It reminds us that our goal is to connect, to enhance community, and to engage in genuine exchange. So the Kodak series begins here with Claude Steele and his research on the impact of stereotype threat and moves tomorrow to a conversation among experts to the topic of inclusive excellence. Joining Claude will be Mitchell Chang from UCLA, who will be speaking on what two decades of research tells us about the educational benefits associated with diversity, Carolyn Turner from Arizona State and Cal State Sacramento on the importance of diversifying the faculty, and Gabor Bosri from UC Berkeley on key lessons from Berkeley's strategic diversity plan. The unscripting dialogue continues during winter term when Lawrence Bobo from Harvard University comes during our MLK celebration week to talk about the racial color line and Daryl Smith from Claremont Graduate University comes in February to discuss diversity's promise for higher education. And our final event, one that I am particularly looking forward to because it in and of itself is a bit off script, Guy Kawasaki will be speaking about enchantment and diversity. Some of you may know him as a marketing guru since Guy was considered the chief evangelist for Apple. Guy will share his wisdom on how to gauge, engage around diversity, equity, and inclusion all through the lens of enchantment. We believe he is the perfect capstone for helping us talk about diversity in ways that are fresh and meaningful to a broad range of players. Now, before I turn this over to my friend and colleague, Robin Holmes, the interim VP for Equity and Inclusion, as well as the VP for Student Affairs, I want to take a moment to thank those people who, who have helped make Kodak a reality. It is a very long list, and I invite you to visit the posters that are in the atrium 
uh, to see some, just a few of their names. There are two names I would like to single out, however. Rob Proudfoot was an original member of the planning committee and a faculty member in international studies. He passed away in 2006. Keith Aoki was an early advisory board member and a cheerleader for CODA, as well as a faculty member in the law school. He passed away earlier this year, and both men are very sorely missed. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our many campus sponsors. They include Academic Affairs, Architecture and Allied Arts, the College of Education, Finance and Administration, the Graduate School, OIED, Journalism and Communication, the Oregon Humanities Center, the Law School, Leadership and Communication Center, U of O Libraries, the Lundquist College of Business, the School of Music and Dance, the Office of the President, Robert D. Clark Honors College, the Division of Student Affairs, and the Departments of Psychology and Sociology. Again, thank you. And now, here is Robin to introduce our student guest guest speaker. Thank you, Mia. Wow, this is so exciting. And thank you to Kodak. Before I introduce Dr. Steele, I wanted to take just a moment to read a message from U of O President Richard Olivier, who was not able to be here today, but wanted to send his greetings for this important event. And he says, colleagues and friends, congratulations on 10 years of wonderful and important work. Everyone associated with Kodak has made this campus and this community a more diverse and welcoming place. Having Dr. Steele with you is a perfect way to affirm your efforts. He's helped us understand how stereotypes affect student learning and what we as educators need to do about it. I hope you take advantage of the march this evening and tomorrow's symposium. We all know that there is much to accomplish and I have the utmost confidence that with our collective dedication and the leadership by the Kodak staff, we will keep moving forward. We are ever mindful of our mission, a dedication to the principles of equality of opportunity and freedom from unfair discrimination for all members of the university community and an acceptance of true diversity as an affirmation of individual identity within a welcoming community. I wish I could be with you, but please know that I stand arm in arm with you. And congratulations again, and here's to the next 10 years. So we thank Richard for that note. And I am thrilled to welcome and, uh, and honored to introduce Dr. Claude Steele. Dr. Steele is known far and wide for his writings about issues of identity and stereotypes. The title of his book, Whistling Vivaldi, How Stereotypes Affect Us and What We Can Do, comes from the experience of a New York Times columnist, Brent Staple, who found that when he would walk the streets of Chicago's Hyde Park neighborhood, people often scurried away in fear, simply because he was a young black man in a primarily white neighborhood. They were succumbing to the stereotype of young black men as violent thugs. But Staples found that if, when he walked those same sidewalks, he whistled from Vivaldi's Four Seasons, the tension drained from people's bodies, and they did not seem as fearful. So, whistling Vivaldi came to symbolize one of those things that people do to ameliorate the impact of stereotype, a topic that Dr. Steele has researched and written about extensively. He is a pioneer in research regarding identity and stereotype threat and the myriad ways that stereotypes, both positive and negative, impact intellectual and academic performance. Dr. Steele joins us from his new position as the I. James Cohen Dean of the School of Education at Stanford. He originally joined the Stanford faculty in 1991 and served as a Lucy Stern Professor of Psychology. He left Stanford to serve as provost at Columbia from 2009 until this past He's also served on the faculties of the University of Michigan, University of Washington, and University of Utah. Dr. Steele is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Education, and the National Academy of Sciences. He's received many honors and awards, including the Distinguished Scientific Career Awards from both the American Psychological Association and American Psychological Society. Without further ado, I hope you will join me in giving Dr. Steele a warm Oregon welcome. Thank you, Robin. That was really wonderful. 
Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. As some of you know, um, uh, I spent a lot of years in the Northwest, <laughs> 14 years in the Northwest at the University of Washington, and uh, uh, it's always a great pleasure to come back, on, especially on a completely prototypic Northwest day like today, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's beautiful. If you've lived here for a while, you get a real taste for this, and I, 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 uh, I miss it. Um, well, my mission today is just to give you kind of an overview of this uh, research program uh, that has looked at the effects of stereotypes about our various identities, stereotypes about our age, our race, our gender, our occupation, uh, the effect that these stereotypes have on our functioning, uh, our our intellectual functioning, our relationships with each other, um, even our athletic performance in, in some instances. So that's going to be the general topic of what we've found out over the last 25 years about those uh, uh, kinds of effects. They're, they're su it's summarized uh, for the most part with two concepts of stereotype threat and social identity threat. Uh, uh, but it's very important, and I want to stress this at the outset of the talk, it's very important to uh, realize the, the, the basic you know, problem solving that underlies the work that really re they, those ideas respond in an effort to just ex uh, understand some basic problems that I think everybody in this, uh, in this audience is concerned with, diversity, underperformance, things of that sort. So I, I, I will begin there. Uh, but I do want to stress uh, two kind of subtexts that I, I hope you'll uh, get out of the talk. Uh, and th this is important in increasingly as I get my both feet back into uh, education. Um, uh, the, this, this is kind of an important point I think is often mi missed, which is how important the social context is for our function, uh, especially our intellectual function. We think of that as a kind of irrepressible thing, how smart you are. Uh, and we, uh, I think, miss the uh, huge role that this context uh, that the context plays in our intellectual functioning. And so I hope you are kind of uh, getting a good impression of that uh, uh, as I go along. Uh, the other thing that, that uh, I, I'd love to have you uh, take home from this is a, is a sense of how research aimed at solving real practical problems can wind up often uh, providing very basic understandings about how, how people function and the like. This is the tale of this research. I've done a, I have a number of research programs in my career, and I'm sort of proudest of this because it really starts out with a, a practical problem that I'm just about to describe for you and, and kind of uh, wound up saying some basic things about uh, psychological functioning and so on. So um, where did it begin? Uh, it, it began when I left the Northwest and went to the Midway. When I left the University of Washington and moved to the University of Michigan, and is the fate of many minority faculty, was put on the committee, the university committee, for the retention and recruitment of minority students. <laughs> um, and as I sat down, I can sort of still remember the scene. Uh, they handed us a bunch of analyses that they'd done and so on, and on the top of the uh, stack wa was a, a set of data that really uh, presented to me the puzzle that this re research was born trying to solve. Uh, and th this, I'm going to give you a, a sense of it here. These are not the actual data from that, but they are, and they're not actual data, but they represent the pattern of data the, the, uh, in a figurative way here. Uh, what it was, yeah. hear me to the same degree? OK, wonderful, I'm free. <laughs> um, uh, it was the cumulative grade point average of students at the University of Michigan. So that would be on this uh, axis here. Lower grade point averages down there, and then higher grade point averages up there, what that scale means. Graphed as a function of the uh, SAT score uh, or ACT score they had when they entered Michigan. And uh, what, what you saw is, is this. This is a very typical uh, pattern that students who enter with higher scores down here tend to have somewhat higher grade point averages across their career at Michigan. There's really nothing surprising about that. That's what those tests sort of earn their keep doing is predicting roughly how well people do in college. I always stress at this point, it's, it's important to realize how little they predict how, or how weakly they make this prediction. Uh, you know, the SAT um, measures, captures about 18% of the things that drive freshman grades in college. 18%, that's all. And for some populations, that percentage is much less. 
Um, and in some schools, it's much less. So it's, it's a number, but it's not a, a, a number capturing a hugely important thing. That's an, it's useful. I'm not making a big case here, but it's not as all-powerful as we tend to think it is, I think, in everyday life. Uh, at any rate, that wasn't uh, what surprised me that day. The next thing is what surprised me that day, which was that it also broke out the uh, grade point averages as a function of test scores for African American students separately. And when, when it did that, what you saw is that at every level of entering uh, preparation for college as measured by one of these objective tests at every single level, all the way up to the highest, the students coming in with the highest test scores, black students at Michigan were getting lower grades than other students at Michigan. And that was what was really confusing. Why would that be the case? Uh, if you told me that black students on average had lower grades than, than white students uh, at Michigan, I would not have been surprised because among the very strong students that would get admitted to that college, you might expect that white students would have, that, excuse me, that black students would have somewhat lower grades because, um, you know, educational opportunity is still affected by race in this, in this country. And so you might imagine still among kids good enough to get in there, there might be some difference in preparation which mani might manifest itself on grades when they got there. So that would not have been surprising, just the average difference. But was what was surprising and kind of mysterious was that at every level of preparation, you're holding preparation constant. So uh, way out here, you've got kids with both the black kids and the white kids have 1,500 SAT scores, and yet black students are getting lower grades than, than, than uh, other students were. Wh why would that be the case? Um, and, um, you know, we soon found out that the same thing, interestingly, was true for women in advanced math classes. Michigan, that if you arrayed their grades they got in those classes as a function of their test scores or even their grades in earlier, uh, uh, less difficult classes, uh, you found the same thing, that men got scored there and women scored reliably there. Uh, soon we found out that this was a well-known phenomenon, that um, it didn't just happen at the University of Michigan, but it happens absolutely everywhere. Uh, it happens in you know, a middle school in New Jersey, it happens at uh, Harvard Law School, Columbia Medical School. Uh, it happens everywhere, this underperformance where uh, a group uh, whose abilities are negatively stereotyped, intellectual abilities are negatively stereotyped in the larger uh, population, uh, when you look at some subsequent level of performance, they perform a, a, a significantly worse than their test scores would predict significantly worse than other people with the same test scores, and that's what's known as the underperformance phenomenon. And uh, the, the question then was, well, why on earth would this happen? Uh, and what I will do in uh, talking about this is to give you, I'll save you, we, we looked around for many years to come up with some coherent story <laughs> here, uh, and I'll save you all those years. <laughs> And uh, first, just present our general account of this, of, of, of what we think explains this. Then I'll present a few experiments to sort of remind you of some of the demonstrations that go into uh, uh, giving evidence to this uh, argument. Then we'll talk about what makes the pressure that causes this worse or, or, or better, what, what, what determines the strength of this pressure. And then we can talk about remedies, things you can do uh, to fix it, and approaches that you, that you can take to to fix it. Um, okay, that's the plan. <coughs> the um, theory, the explanation, uh, begins with a very simple definition of social identities. And uh, maybe my uh, thing will work. Yeah, it does work. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of slides. This is, these are just the, the two, and then I get to talking, and I never remember to go and use the other slides. So <laughs> I can just warn you of that as we begin. Uh, social identity, it's the part of our personal identity that comes from our group memberships in the social categories to which we belong. It's a very textbook definition of what social identities are. The main reason I put it up is so you can see that there are an awful lot of them. Uh, age, sex, race, ethnicity, uh, social class, ideological persuasion, mental health status, physical health status. All of these things qualify as uh, social identities. You, you might argue, as some do, that no two people on the face of the earth have the same combination of social identities, that that's the, 
the uh, source of our individuality. It's a unique combination of them. Uh, the next question in this explanation, in this theory, is what makes a given social identity important to us? What makes one of these things really important in the sense of it being critical or central to how we function and, and uh, how we behave and the, and the like, how we live our lives? What makes an, a, an identity important to us? Uh, the answer there is of, of, of a simple uh, idea that with a complicated label, uh, social identity contingency. All that means is that a social identity becomes important to us when we have to deal with things in our lives because we have to them. When we're in some important circumstances uh, or situations and we have to deal with things that, conditions that go with having that identity. Let me give you an example. Uh, I, I begin the book uh, with a, a story of uh, wh when did I first become aware of, of being African American, uh, being black? When did I first get that idea? And I, it's a story that, that is intended to show how contingencies make a given social identity uh, important to you. And to, to the best of my uh, memory, I, c I remember coming home in I think the third grade on the last day of school. We, I lived in Chicago. And uh, we were all walking home, happy, looking at the whole summer in front of us. And we were talking about going swimming. And then somebody in the group says, yeah, but we can only go swimming in the, in the area pool on Wednesday afternoons. That's the only day that, that black kids can go swimming on, on, uh, uh, in, the, in this pool. It's on Wednesday afternoons. These were the segregations of that, of that day. Uh, and I can remember thinking, what? Well, you know, who, who who is they and who is black and what what's what does all this mean and why would we not be able to go and and uh, I you know I had no answer to any of these questions I just had a ton of questions and then I found out later that we could only go to the roller rink on Thursday night we couldn't go any other uh, uh, night it was like we could only be act like regular people in the middle of the week or something there seemed to be <laughs> some mysterious constraint here. And, and you're trying to figure out, well, what, what does it mean? We couldn't caddy in the golf courses. And, and uh, life seemed weird. It, uh, the, these features of life seemed weird. And they made you think about, well, what does it mean to be, in those days, Negro? This is the 50s and the 60s. What, what does that mean? What is, who is a Negro and who is not a Negro? And what, is that, what does that mean? Well, those are the, that's what I mean by uh, uh, contingency. They reflect the way uh, a society is organized around a given identity, like the way Chicagoland was organized around race at that time with, with housing segregation and de facto school segregation and employment discrimination and all of these kinds of things. And then all this whole pattern of little minor uh, segregations that characterize life. Encountering these contingencies make you deal with uh, this uh, identity in an important way. Uh, and that's how that identity starts to become important. You start to w figure it out. What does it mean? You, you relate to other people who also have the identity, and you try to figure out what they're thinking about having this identity, and you, you become kind of, in, in a sense, a, ver a, a cohesive group in, in, in this way. Well, uh, what I'm trying to do in this approach to identity uh, is to rooted in the reality of, of our lives, to show how our social identities are rooted in, in the reality of our lives, we psychologists uh, can decontextualize things. That is, we can see things as just happening inside my head. So my identity about race could be something that's just inside my head, and I could decide whether I take it uh, seriously or whether I don't take it seriously. I could make it strong. I could make it weak. I have all these degrees of freedom because in psychology, I'm not fleshing out where the identity comes from and, where and, and why it's, it's central like that. So I guess I'm borrowing here a perspective from sociology, that, that these identities are rooted in the way a society is organized at a given time. If I was in Lagos, Nigeria, being black would mean probably nothing. Everybody's black. It's, there's no particular organization that goes with that. I, my religion might be a real big identity for me because that society is maybe pretty organized around religious communities and there's all kinds of segregations and orderings that go with that. And so that might become something I'd have to deal with in the same way in the United States you have to deal with, with, with race. Uh, so in, in, in this way, I'm trying to root identities in, in the conditions that you have to deal with because you have the identity. 
that's where th- they come from, and that's what makes them important, and that's what makes them impossible to ignore. They become conditions of life. We don't have complete freedom over them. They're conditions of, of life that you have to deal with in some way. We have a great deal of freedom about how we deal with it, but I guess the big point I want to stress here is that uh, uh, you have to deal with it. Piece, and that's where an identity comes from and how, how they get to be important. Uh, okay, <coughs> the next point is um, there are some contingencies that are real obvious, like the segregation, the racial segregation of that era that are really concrete and unavoidable on the ground. And then there are other uh, uh, contingencies of social identity that are more abstract and Delphic, but that I want to argue are just as important. And I would put stereotype threat in that category as a contingency of identity. It has all the effects of a contingency. Forces people to take a given identity seriously. Forces people to develop a sense of self built around that identity. Uh, even though stereotypes can seem like they're just abstract and Delphic and, there's, and we have powerful ide- uh, uh, ideologies that te- tell us that we should just be able to ignore stereotypes. Um, I'm going to argue, at least for the moment, uh, that uh, stereotypes uh, can be contingencies of identity in the same way these concrete segregations can be. And what I mean by stereotype threat, just to remind you, is a very simple thing. It's just whenever you're in a situation or you're doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities becomes relevant. And I, I sort of underscore the term relevant. When you're doing something or you're in a situation where a negative stereotype about one of your identities, your age, your physical uh, health, your mental health, when it becomes relevant, you know at some level, often uh, sort of semi-conscious, you know that you could be judged or treated in terms of that stereotype. And if you care about what you're doing in that situation, if you care about that situation, the prospect of being reduced to a negative stereotype is upsetting and distracting and can interfere with your functioning right then and there. And if this goes on, if this becomes a a feature of your experience in a domain of life, like schooling or like being in a STEM field, if this becomes a regular chronic feature of your life, it can affect your willingness to be in that that area. It can affect your whether or not you choose to go into that field or or, or not. (coughs) Excuse me. So that's that's what uh, uh, a stereotype, what, what I mean by stereotype threat and, and how I'm thinking of it as a, uh, uh, you'll, you'll f- I'll try to make it, I'll come back to this contingency idea because it can seem very abstract, but it's very important for a later uh, part of this argument. Um, but our initial question was, well, uh, you know, the, could stereotype threat play a role in this underperformance? Uh, you know, it's, it is uh, a very general phenomenon. I think people, there's not a single social identity that exists that, uh, that doesn't have some negative stereotype. You can think of, and most of us could write down the negative stereotypes about all the groups in our, uh, in our midst that we know about. We could write those stereotypes down. Uh, we all know them. Uh, and, <coughs> you know, we know the circumstances under which they, b- they become relevant and they, c- they can affect us. So I think maybe even, you know, on a daily basis, we experience this, this kind of threat. I've got all kinds of examples. I remember when I was the uh, chair of the psychology department at Stanford and the psychology department got moved from answering to a social science dean to answering to a natural science dean. And uh, <laughs> uh, I can remember going into the first couple of meetings with this new dean uh, making the case for psychology as a, as big science, you know, that we're really, uh, you know, highly technical. We use MRI machines, and I'm just fanning the image of psychology as this big, hard-edged uh, science. And after a couple of, of, of meetings like this, you know, I, 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 I observed to myself, why, why are you doing this? I'm a social psychologist. We, we're not high-tech. We're low-tech. <laughs> Uh, why am I making the case that psychology is this high-tech thing? And, you know, the, the, the best sort of, sort of self-regard-saving answer that I came up with is, is stereotype threat. That I'm not here responding to a stereotype about my age or my gender or my race. I'm, I'm responding to a stereotype about my discipline, about my science. 
that, that uh, maybe this chemist who I was talking to, uh, and who has the power to allocate resources, he might be thinking of psychology as a little bit more mushy than uh, astrophysics, and so we might have fallen down in the priority scheme in that, in, in that deanship, and so you know, here I am without any awareness of it, this is the important thing, without any awareness of it, and without him having said a word to me about it, I'm contending with this very thing. So, um, does that play a role in women's underperformance in difficult math uh, classes? After all, we've got this kind of bad stereotype in this society. We, we can call it, I think, openly the Larry Summers stereotype. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the former president of Harvard, whose presidency unraveled after he uh, sort of spoke the stereotype uh, in, a, in a, a meeting of, of uh, trying to address the issue of women's participation in STEM fields, and he alleges in the middle of his speech that, well, part of the reason might be that women lack uh, math ability at the high end, to quote him. Uh, so uh, everybody, in, again, in society, in our society could write that stereotype do down, we know it. Uh, so the question is, could, could having to contend with that stereotype in difficult math uh, classes and, and difficult math tests, could that be a factor? And that was the first question we took up in the, in, in the research, and, and in some ways uh, I'll, I'll remind you of that study just to sort of illustrate the, the phenomenon uh, again. Uh, we we uh, asked very uh, strong women and men math majors to come into our laboratory one at a time, and we gave them a math test, a half hour section of the graduate records exam that you take uh, if you're a math major. So this is a very difficult uh, math test, and it's going to cause frustration for everybody. But our reasoning was that the frustration would, cause, would make this experience funda fundamentally different for women than for men, fundamentally different. The reason is that that frustration would occasion, it would make the stereotype about women's math ability, this negative stereotype, relevant to them in this situation, relevant as a possible interpretation of the experience they're having, and it might raise fears that they're confirming the stereotype or that they'd be seen to confirm the stereotype, and then they would be, because we picked women and men who were really good at math, they would they care about how well they do at math. They'd start to maybe try too hard and overcome the stereotype. They, they'd be distracted in some way. It would interfere with their functioning and their math performance on this time test that they're done. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, women who we carefully selected for having the same skills as men, uh, the men in this experiment, performed almost a full standard deviation lower than men in under this circumstance. And we gave them this difficult test at the frontier of their uh, skills. Now, <coughs> you might note that Larry Summers, <laughs> if he were arguing with me, would say, well, Claude, that's exactly what I would predict, uh, that you gave him a hard test uh, at sort of in the, at the high end, right? And uh, so maybe on easier tests, you don't get much of a gender difference, but on, these, on this really hard test, you, you do. And so that's all you found there was that uh, there's a biological difference that manifests itself in a difficult test. So, of course, we had to separate out our explanation from his explanation. Uh, and as I report in the book, this was an era of great tension in our laboratory. The last thing we wanted to find was evidence for the Larry Summers uh, uh, hypothesis. Uh, but we had to put this to a fair test. And moreover, we had to come up with some way that would cleanly take the stereotype threat out of this test situation for women but leave it as a test that, that they knew could test their math ability. How could you make, make them feel like the stereotype was irrelevant to their performance, uh, even though it's a test of math ability? That alone could make the stereotype uh, uh, relevant to their performance. So we, we puzzled, it probably took a year or so. And eventually we came to a very simple sentence. Just, we did the experiment over, and just before the men and the women, again, one at a time, in a room alone with the math, half hour math test, just before they entered the room, we told them, look, you may have heard that women don't do as well as men on difficult math tests. You may have heard that. Uh, but that's not true for this particular test. The particular test that you're taking today 
does not discriminate between men and women. Men and women always do the same. They always do the same on this. They always will. It's incapable of distinguishing between men and women. Blah, blah, blah. So now when they experience this frustration, the stereotype about women's math ability <coughs> is made irrelevant to the, as an interpretation of what's happening to them because this is a test that can't tell you anything about your being a woman. It can tell you that you're not good at math, but not, that just puts you in the same boat that the men are in. And when you do that, women's math performance goes up to match that of equally skilled men. Completely opposite to men. No difference whatsoever. Now that was the day that really was <laughs> the one of the most gratifying. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that day <laughs> and how that worked. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. <coughs> and we couldn't believe it and we replicated it, you know, 50 times in our own lab and we called people and we asked them, would you do this? Would you replicate it? And they, they got it and we presented it at meetings and people would not believe it. They would not believe it. They would not believe that that performance would go up to, be, to, to, uh, to have no difference there. They just wouldn't believe it. Th this, this stereotype is very strong in this society. It's still very strong uh, in this society. And so people just found this very difficult to believe. I mean, everybody converged on trying to replicate this thing. There must be probably a thousand studies done now all over the world uh, in an attempt to replicate that one particular finding about women in math. We immediately went to a society that didn't have a strong uh, women in math uh, stereotype. We went to Poland where uh, perhaps because of the history of communism, uh, you have a world where in the STEM fields, uh, something is, am I hitting this? Bear with me. <laughs> uh, we went to Poland where in the STEM fields probably 50%, uh, close to 50% of the, of, of the, of the uh, people are women. And so the stereotype about women in math is very, very weak there, and we didn't get these underperformance effects there. So this really encouraged us that we had something to do with the stereotypes of a given society in a given time. We, 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 Josh Aronson and I immediately turned to race, I think one of the better studies done there is a very simple study. You give uh, black and white a difficult IQ test. In this case, it had some real niceties to it. It was a, a Raven's progressive matrices IQ test. You get each item is a big square, and there's a pattern on the square. And then there are five little squares, and you have to pick with patterns in them, and you have to pick which of the five little squares has the same pattern as the big square. That's all you got to do. It's nonverbal. It's seen as a gold standard of the, I, uh, of the IQ test. And the beauty of it here is that you can present it to people as an IQ test, and you can convincingly also present it to people as having nothing to do with intelligence whatsoever. It's just a puzzle. That's the beauty of this particular test. So uh, when you give the IQ test to, to uh, uh, black and white college students and you let them assume that it's a test of intelligence, you don't even have to say that. You just let them assume it's a test of intelligence. The black students score a full standard deviation lower than the white students, which is, interestingly, exactly the size of the IQ gap between whites and, and blacks in the larger population, standard deviation, 15 points on an IQ test. You just, we could just bottle it regularly in the laboratory like that. But when you told them that the IQ test was a puzzle, that difference went completely away, just completely gone. Blacks. IQ rose 15 points and matched those of the white students in that, in that situation. So these kind of things were beginning to tell us this is a powerful uh, process um, and, and that it isn't just a little thing, that it can have a big effect on uh, intellectual functioning. Again, uh, it's against the backdrop of our assumptions in society that, that uh, uh, IQ and things of this sort are, are sort of irrepressible and that I mean, just think what we assume. That we assume that I could give anybody in this room, uh, you know, a three-hour SAT exam. I can give you an exam in three hours that uh, is such a good measure of your uh, intellectual capacity that I can use your score on that test to allocate opportunity for you for the rest of your life. That's kind of what we, that's, that's the level of faith that we put in a three-hour paper and pencil standardized test. Are we crazy or what? I don't, 
Uh, does, does anybody really privately believe that you can sum up a human being's potential with a three-hour sit-down experience like that? I, I, I don't know. When you get back from it a bit and out of the cultural frame, it seems a bit absurd. But we do. We've all been so raised in this uh, ideology of intelligence being a stable uh, and differentiating, powerfully differentiating uh, 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 measure. Uh, I mean, think what if, if, if the full range of an SAT measures only 18% of the things that go into freshman grades and a lower percentage of what goes into sophomore grades and graduation rates at life income, um, what's the di what, how big of a difference would just 200 points on that test make? Right. Well, nothing. It doesn't mean anything. A, a kid with a 1,300 versus a kid with 1,100, we act like even two points different on that test is a big deal. But uh, it, it, it probably means nothing. Probably, in, um, somebody put this to me a couple months ago, that you probably think of the SAT as probably being worth three points. You get a one, two, or three. <laughs> it's really high, kind of regular, or you know maybe you need some more work. And that's about all that test really tells you, but it's got this scale which makes it, anyway, I'm going off on a, a digression here. <coughs> Back to uh, this research. Um, so, you know, we started doing it in every, we started testing stereotypes that in every which way, so to speak. Uh, can you get white males to, to show this effect? Yes, you give, uh, we got graduate student engineer, uh, engineering graduate students at Stanford and uh, white males and, and you told them uh, just before they sat down to take the test, this is a test, and we do the best you can, this is a test on which Asians tend to do better than whites. And sure enough, under the sort of negative light of another group's positive stereotype, performance goes down. Because every time, remember how it works, every time you're experiencing frustration, you've got that, you got that whole framework, that stereotype framework to interpret what's happening to you. And, and now you, you, you've got this extra concern that, uh, you know, maybe this whole ability thing is not right and that it, the stereotype is correct and I could be seen as a... A lot's going on there. You're beginning, you're having to allocate cognitive resources to figuring out this whole thing while you're taking the test. So that's basically what, what I, I think is the best way to, to think about it. It's like multitasking. You're doing two things at once. Uh, I think another good image for it that, that, that helps me is to think of it as like um, you go home and you want to watch a football game and flop down on the couch and somebody says, you know, you're not going to believe this, but a snake got in the house. <laughs> There's a snake in the house. Uh, it happened to me one time. <laughs> it wasn't a pleasant experience. Uh, it happened in New York City last year. A little cobra got out of its cage in the Bronx Zoo, and, and uh, they discovered it like three weeks later, and it hadn't gone anywhere. It was just in the corner of the, of the room where the cage was, but it was a baby cobra. But for those three weeks, you know, people in New York were nervous every, <laughs> everywhere, you know, like, whoa. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you, that, that gives you the image of what I think stereotype threat is like in the sense that, you know, part of your brain is always allocated to figuring out, is there, is there something going on here? Is there, uh, am, am, am I going to be seen in terms of the stereotype or, or, or not? It's, it's, it's like that. Um, the, you know, we know a lot about what mediates this or what it looks like for people, uh, the, the, the internal uh, experience of people who are under stereotype threat. Every, every physiological indicator is, is elevated. Your blood pressure goes up. Uh, you know, your heart rate goes up. Your galvanic skin response, how much you're sweating goes up. Uh, the part of your brain that you recruit to solve cognitive problems is reduced and quieted down. And the part of your brain, the amygdala that is uh, uh, more sensitive to threat in the environment is very activated. So you're, you're basically monitoring when you're in a situation where uh, you could ex be under stereotypes. If you're basically monitoring what's going to happen next, what, what's going to happen to me, what's, gonna, what's going on. Um, so that, that I think is a, a, a good representation of this and, and I, I tell the story in this order so you can see how these processes come into view. It's not that they're new processes or that you never thought of them before. I think uh, for us it was this, this sort of careful step after step scientific effort to, to bring them into to, to view, to bring them out of a kind of mud and clear them off and show that they were as powerful as they uh, seemed to be. 
Uh, so the, 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 the next question that is, is important is, well, what makes this threat strong and what makes this threat weak? I can remember us just going over that question over and over again. And again, here is where the psychologist is in us led us down a wrong path. And the sociologist in us, I think, led us down a better path, a more fruitful path. The psychologist in us, which I point out is very much like the way we think as lay people. We think like psychologists. That's the, that's the, cl the, the closest sort of frame that we use in our everyday thinking. Um, our, our reasoning would be, and I used to, uh, as I described stereotype threat effects to people initially in meetings and sometimes still, and it greatly frustrates me, uh, they would say, well, what you're saying, uh, Professor Steele, is that, uh, aren't you saying, uh, they're thinking that they're agreeing with you, aren't you saying that this is really something that's low self-esteem, right, or lack of confidence, uh, or, um, you know, maybe low expectations. There are a variety of words which, with which you're familiar that people use to, to, de to describe that. And they say, well, that, you know, maybe people have internalized that stereotype, members of stereotype groups, women in math, uh, African Americans in college, uh, maybe they have internalized those stereotypes and, and, and when they're in that kind of situation, the situation just triggers a self-fulfillment of the stereotype. Isn't that self-fulfilling prophecy? Doesn't that, isn't that what it is? And it, it really bugs me to hear that. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but I have to confess that that's what I thought initially. I thought that must be it. That's where I began. Uh, but you can see here a big fat fact in our uh, research which was arguing against that. And the big fat fact is that it was the people who had the best skills in the group who showed the stereotype threat effect the most. It was the women who were the best math students at the University of Michigan and Stanford, the best, who had the strongest confidence, the highest self-esteem, all those internal psychological traits that we think make a person vulnerable to these kind of pressures. They were the strongest and the most resilient and the most persistent. They were the ones that showed the effect. The, the, the women that didn't care that much about math that said, look, I'm going to be a journalist. I'm not into math at all. You put them in an experiment like I just described and you say the test is, uh, this is a test that doesn't show gender differences or this is a test that does show gender differences. They don't do that well, but they don't show any difference between those two conditions. They behave just the same. You take black students, we did this uh, study in, in, uh, in Inglewood High School in, in Los Angeles. You take black students who are uh, unidentified with school, they don't really care about school. They're, they're in school for legal reasons, but uh, they're not particularly excited about being there. You give them a test and you tell them it's a puzzle or it's not a puzzle, doesn't make any difference. They don't do that well, but they just kind of work until they get frustrated and they stop. And they score low. But they don't score different depending on whether that test is a measure of cognitive ability or whether it's a, a puzzle. But the black kids in that school who are identified with school, who tell you it's important to them and important to their futures, they're the ones who underperform when that test is an IQ test and not a puzzle. And they're the ones that perform really well when that test is a puzzle, when you take that stereotype threat pressure off of them. So I, I think in an important way, we misunderstand uh, where this big underperformance and achievement gap is, is coming from. Indeed, some students have given up and have no motivation, and when as soon as the thing gets frustrating, they kind of fold up their tent and go home. But other kids really are still in there and identified with it, but they're suffering under this kind of stereotype threat pressure and they're performing at the same level, so you can't tell the difference between the two groups. You can't tell, they look the same to the teacher and to the school uh, and to the scorer of the test, but, they're, but, they're, but they got through there through very different psychological pathways. And one kind of student is all ready and ripe and willing to, to engage and to grow, but is under this, this pressure as he, uh, uh, from stereotypes about his group, as he moves through the school, this, you know, this, this his schooling. Uh, so that's an important re real, re realization to us, that it wasn't so much due to uh, low self-esteem or low expectancies or uh, things of that sort. What it seemed to be we eventually stumbled on was something that was right in front of our nose all along that was very simple. Uh, 
just cues in the situation that suggest you might be silly. Just cues in the situation that suggest you might be silly talk. Like, suppose you're the only white guy in a class. I remember this student, uh, uh, I've interviewed students a lot over the years. This was a, a, a white student who took an, uh, uh, an African-American uh, history class. And on the fir first day of the class, he goes in and he realizes that he's one of only two uh, white students uh, in a class of about 45 students. All, of, all the other students are, are African-American. And the first day of the class, uh, the professor is showing a videotape of Kinta Kunte being whipped by the, by the, the slave master there. And, <laughs> and then he asks, well, how does everybody feel about that uh, episode? And, <laughs> and this, this kid is, is beginning to shrink down in his, his chair and, <laughs> and, and doesn't answer any question whatsoever. And then, then, then after, it's, uh, after the discussion is over, the professor says, well, all right, let's go around the room and everybody say their names. And by the time it got to, got to him, he actually mispronounced his own name to the... <laughs> to the group. So <laughs> he's feeling a huge amount of stereotype threat pressure uh, in, in that situation as a function of nothing inside his head, as a function of being in that amazing situation with all those cues that suggest that if he makes one sort of verbal error, he could be seen as a racist, which is probably the last thing on earth he ever wants to, to, to have happen. Uh, we did an experiment. We, we asked well, what kind of stereotype threat pressure would, would whites feel most commonly? And well, uh, you know, you think for a second and you, and you come right to the answer. They, the, the stereotype about whites in this society reflecting our history, just like the stereotypes about women and, and other groups reflecting our history, stereotype about whites is that they're racist. So we had white males come into the laboratory one at a time, and we told them they're going to be in a conversation with two other students. And we're going to pick the topic of the conversation. So they see the photograph of the two students they're going to take, that they're going to have a conversation with. In one condition, it's two white guys. In another condition, it's two black guys. And then they find out that they're going to, uh, that the topic of the conversation is either going to be something that's kind of easy to talk about, love and relationships, or it's going to be racial profiling. So they know they're going to talk to either two white guys or two black guys, and they're going to either talk about love and relationships or racial profiling. And at that point, the experimenter says to the subject, look, I'm going to go down the hall, and I'm going to get your two conversation partners, and I'm going to bring them back for the conversation. And look, there's three chairs over there. Would you arrange the three chairs for the conversation? Would you arrange the three chairs? And then the experimenter leaves the room, and the person arranged the chairs, and you can probably anticipate the experiment's over at that point. What we're really interested in is how do they arrange these chairs? How do they space themselves for this conversation? Uh, <coughs> and you probably aren't going to be surprised by the result. When, when you're talking, when the white subject guys are talking to two uh, white guys about anything, they put the three chairs very close together. When they're talking to two black guys about love and relationships, they put the three chairs very close together. But when they're talking to two black, black guys about racial profile, they put the two black guys down here and themselves over here, a good distance between them, because they're, and we know from all kinds of other measures, that what's in the top of their mind is the possibility of being seen as a racist. That's what's on the top of their mind. Uh, I, I'll spare you the technology that you, the methodology you use to, to do that, but it's like a Rorschach test. And uh, that's what's on the top of their minds in that situation. And here's the interesting thing, that who would you think would be would in that condition, there's a white guy talking to two black guys about racial profiling, who would you think would put their chair farthest away from the two black guys? The, the white guy who's more racist or the white guy who's least racist? The guy who's the least racist puts his chair farthest away. We have measured their degree of racial prejudice before they were in the experiment, so we have some good sense of, of that. And what you find is that the people who are the least prejudiced, I mean, this is not a group that has big prejudice in it. These are college students, and, but there's some variation. And the people who are the, uh, the least prejudiced put their chairs farthest away. It's the women who are the strongest math students that show the biggest effect of the stereotype threat. 
it's the African Americans who are the best students who show the effects of the stereotype threat. It's the whites who are the most invested in not being seen as a racist, who in this situation with two black strangers talking about something as loaded as racial profiling, want to move their chairs farther away because the possibility of, of having a, uh, making a mistake and being seen as racist in that kind of conversation would be very upsetting to that person, so they are more tense in that situation. Well, this is how I think stereotype threat comes down to affect our relationships with each other. I think I'm going to make this statement more strongly than I probably absolutely believe or could defend. But I believe these kind of pressures, these kind of stereotype threat pressures are more important in our race relations today than prejudices, than old-fashioned racial prejudice. And I'm not for a minute saying racial prejudice is off the table, because it's not. But I think these kind of dynamics are more important in uh, uh, our relationships with each other uh, than uh, are is any actual level of, of, of prejudice uh, there. Well, all of this is to uh, make this point that uh, the circumstances, the conditions of the situation seem to drive the strength of this, of this pressure. So if I, if I put, you know, and w one huge uh, 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 factor, situational factor that, that drives the sense of, of uh, group threat is, is, the, is the numbers question, the, the question of critical mass, whether there are enough other people with my same identity in a situation for me to feel that I won't be singled out because I've got this identity. I do in the book a real careful analysis of Sandra Day O'Connor uh, experience on the Supreme Court. I remember uh, having a conviction this on May the, the, the University of Michigan Supreme Court defense of affirmative action was announced, I think, on June 23rd, 2003. And on May 13th, 2003, I felt almost 100% confident that I knew how this decision was going to go. And the reason I felt that way is that on the radio that day was an interview of Nina Totenberg and Sandra Day O'Connor. And if you'll remember, Sandra Day O'Connor was the swing vote on that decision. How she went would go the decision. The other justices were evenly divided on the, on the cases. So how she went would, would, would determine everything. And in this interview, she never talked about affirmative action. Uh, sh uh, she was on the radio because she'd just written an autobiography. And, uh, and, the autobi and, and Totenberg was interviewing her about that autobiography. And at one point, of course, she says, well, what was it like when you went on the Supreme Court? And Sandra Day O'Connor says, it was asphyxiating. It was asphyxiating when I first went on, on that court. Everywhere I went, the reporters followed me into restaurants. They would follow me into the parking garage. Uh, it, there was comment about every decision I made. There were phone calls from reporters all over the world. There were questions. Is she smart enough? Is she really smart enough to be in the Supreme Court? Is she really wise enough? Is she, is she uh, a feminist? Is she not feminist enough? I mean, she had scrutiny from absolutely every uh, side. So here's the deal. Those are contingencies of her identity on that Supreme Court when she was the only woman on that Supreme Court. That's the important thing to, so that's the situation she was facing as the only woman on the Supreme Court. Now, as she goes on in the interview, Totenberg says, well, what happened when Ruth Bader Ginsburg got there? And she says, well, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg got there, the world just, I everything changed. It, it was just flipped. We were just two of nine justices. Nobody followed me into restaurants anymore. Nobody asked special questions about what my decision making was. Now, all that was gone with just two of us on the Supreme Court. That's the argument about critical mass that Michigan had made. That it is important if you're going to have a university to have enough uh, minority students in that university so that they do not feel under special scrutiny because of their minority status. And you cannot expect them to learn as well or that the situation can be considered fair unless you have a critical mass. That's a cue in a situation that drives the strength of that threat because in it, it's telling you the contingencies that could be tied to that uh, ad ad identity in, the, in, that si in that situation. So because I knew that Sandra Day O'Connor, even if only implicitly, but she knew what critical mass meant to her. She was on the court when she had critical mass, and she was on the court when she didn't have critical mass. 
So she knew the difference between those two things. And that's why it's so damn important to have somebody like her on the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, somebody who can have insight into that. Because you'd have to have that experience. If somebody just told you that experience, it would be very abstract, and you'd think it was probably a, a bullshit argument that somebody's making for other reasons, and, and you would have all kinds of rational reasons to doubt it. Uh, but if somebody's been through it, then you, you'd get it. And I knew she had gotten it, and so that's what made me feel so confident. Anyway, that's what uh, uh, I think makes this thing. Um, you, you, there are lots of other cues that can signal uh, uh, possible contingencies tied to an identity. And this is how the, the contingency thing fits into the stereotype threat thing, that the cues that make the threat intense are basically cues in a situation signaling that they're going to be contingencies. I went to a, a, a Silicon Valley startup firm to visit an old student. Uh, I walked in, he introduced me to the CEO who was 26 years old. And uh, there were bicycles hanging from the rafters over the cubicles and there were dogs walking around in the office and there was music I'd never heard before. And uh, these cues made me feel really old. <laughs> they made me feel that identity. And if I had to actually work there and have my software writing taken seriously, you can imagine how serious that would be. I would worry that, that I was just going to be seen in terms of being an old guy that could never, wasn't born in the digital age and could never write software as well as they could. And then I would be combing over the situation for cues. That, that vigilant part of my brain would be working. Why didn't they uh, return that call I, I just made? Or, you know, that guy didn't sit next to me in the cafeteria yesterday. What does that mean? And I heard they had a party over the weekend and they didn't invite me to the party. And, <laughs> and you, you, you would be sore. And then if another old guy came into the firm, we'd get together and we'd be talking about all those cues that would be, how, well, what did you think about that when he, when he said that, you know? <laughs> um, you know the situation, it's the old Woody Allen movie where they, he's walking down the street and he's talking to the two Jewish guys, he's talking, he's talking to each other and, and, and he says, you heard him, he said Jews guys, didn't he? Didn't he say Jews guys, man? He <laughs> That's how it works and it takes some resources to do it and if you have to live in a domain of life where you're constantly like that, it, 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 it's a burden. And so how do you l remedy this thing? Let's get to that issue. Uh, I think there are two general categories of, of, of remedy, equally important. The first one you can uh, s ex extract from the arguments I've just been making. You ha we have to do as much as we can to reduce those cues in a, in a situation. Um, there's no reason why in the math department at Stanford there had to be 20 photographs of uh, famous mathematicians, all of them white males. And then as the woman as the woman entering graduate student gets to her office, she finds on, on the third floor, she finds that the only women's bathroom is down on the basement under the stairwell. So uh, uh, it's like bicycles hanging from the <laughs> it, These are cues which tell you there could be contingencies here and people might have expectancies for you and so, so on. So we've got to work on that. The physical environment, the social environment, the diversity of the, of, the, uh, of the situation, these are all cues that I take, uh, I read. I love New York because there's all kinds of people in New York and I feel comfortable in New York. I feel like who I am is not going to cause me to be an outsider because everybody, there's so many outsiders there. So uh, diversity has that huge uh, uh, of, uh, importance um, and is essential to intellectual performance and growth. Um, so that's okay. Another thing I think of is in, in the, on the side of dealing with the environment is leadership. Uh, leadership uh, is, we think of that sometimes as just window dressing, but it's extremely important to have that as a value, a stated value, that diversity, and this is what the, this I'm speaking to the choir here, that diversity is fundamental to excellence. And I believe it is absolutely fundamental to excellence. Anytime in any field you see it being done by a people of a small social range, of a single group, that field is not going to be as good as a field that is done by a lot of people. And tomorrow I'll talk a little bit more about, about that. But diversity is absolutely integral. It has always been integral to 
the quality of life in America. It's one of the advantages we have is having such a diverse society and so many perspectives and histories brought to bear on how to set up a country and run a country. And I mean, we've always benefited from diversity. It's always been our major strength. So I think leadership that fosters that value and makes that central, that gives everybody a different framework to live under uh, as, as we go to school and we work in, 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 in society and so on. Then there are circumstances where, uh, you know, the cues are going to be bad and you still want uh, a person to be able to succeed there uh, without knowing that you can't change the, the cues. Uh, how do you deal with that? Well, I use the example, I'm going to get to an ending very quickly here, uh, so we'll have time for questions. But uh, uh, the, the, the example I, I use, uh, I, I describe in the book as my experience of going to graduate school in psychology at Ohio State um, many, many, many years ago, <laughs> and being the only black person in the psychology department, and um, feeling a lot of identity threat in that situation. There was a guy down the hall that would use the N-word on a regular basis in his lectures, the stories he would tell, and just felt he could do that. And then also there was psychology's uh, absurd uh, and perverse uh, fascination with race and IQ and genetic interpretations of the differences between groups and their performance. And it, it just and you, you're supposed to go to a seminar and symposium on that and be just and as a scientist, be completely open to the fact that you and your peoples are genetically different. It's like Nazi science. I'm sorry. It's Nazi science. <laughs> uh, I don't even, as you can tell, begin to, to, to pretend to be objective about that question. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, anyway. Uh, so it was a bad, there were a lot of cues in a situation, and I felt that pressure. Uh, I'll, I'll, I I couldn't talk. I describe in the book how I felt my personality was just submerged. I never said anything in class. Uh, I just sat there and kind of tried to do the best I could and get the hell out of there, but it was a very pressured situation. As time went by, I d my academic advisor, um, uh, we formed a, a very helpful relationship. Uh, a as, as I've said, uh, I think he was coming up to tenure and I was his only graduate student. And so he, like, had to believe in me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he, he demanded a huge amount from me. Uh, and he also affirmed my ability to do it, to, to do it. And I could tell he believed I could do it. And he, he'd stick his head in the, my office at all the time and ask, well, where's the data? What's the analysis say? And he'd call me at Sunday night and tell me to get into the computer center. In those days, you had to go to the computer center to analyze data and stay there all night. And I uh, uh, want to know what the hell happened. And, and um, I could tell this guy kind of believed in me. So all these cues in the environment were still there. But this guy believed in me. So we, I, wor I loved that. I loved that stuff. Uh, and and uh, I worked my butt off for that guy. And, and we did some good things. He, was, he taught me how to be really serious about research. And, and I, I got into it. And we published a paper after a while. And man, when we published a paper, you could hardly talk to me for a while. You know, I just felt like, man, I can do this, this thing. And so as, as these experiences started to go on, uh, the cues in the situation did not change. But they didn't mean the same thing. They just didn't mean the same thing. They didn't mean that I could not be a psychologist. And initially, they did kind of mean that. And it was psychologically suffocating initially. But these experiences kind of got me out of it and gave me a whole different narrative about my experience there, a narrative that had hopefulness in it, not a narrative that had no hope in it. That's the best way I can put it. And uh, Greg Walton, I'll kind of end with this story. Greg Walton and Jeff uh, Cohen did this study. They did a great study in Yale where they injected kids with the, that's one way to think about it, with the right narrative. Uh, they had black and white kids watch a 40-minute videotape of a black kid who was 18 months, ostensibly 18 months ahead of them at Yale. And this black kid in this videotape basically gives them a narrative for their experience, a narrative. He says, when I first came to Yale, I, was, I just felt suffocated. I hated it. All this Gothic architecture. I mean, you know, I, I can't become blonde. I just, 
I just think I'm never going to fit in here. And, and, and I couldn't ca- stand it. And I went home uh, every weekend. And I kept doing that. And finally, my, my father said, look, you're the first in the family to get this opportunity. You've got to go back there and make it. And so he said, do whatever you got to do. And, and so I, I, my, my roommate and I, we formed a singing group. And uh, we would sing after uh, colloquium that were held in the various departments. And I went to the biology department one time, and I heard a colloquium that was just amazing. It was so fascinating, this, this, the, the, this biology that they talked about. And then I had a similar experience in sociology, where it was I just never thought about things that way. A whole new world opened up to me. And then pretty soon I began to feel like, uh, you know, the, the, I'm going to find my life mission in this, in, in this work. And this school is so rich with with, with opportunity and with information and with knowledge and what a privilege it is. So that, that's, the, that's the narrative that they get. So it ends that. And it and ends uh, the narrative after 40 minutes of going on like this, starting negative, getting very positive and hopeful, very much like my experience in graduate school. For, for white students, seeing that videotape didn't have much effect, never did. Uh, and to comp- Belonging in that world wasn't their problem. They never doubted that they really belonged in, in, in that world. Uh, but for the black students, their grade average went up a third of a letter grade in the next semester. A full third of a letter grade in the next semester. And three years later, in their senior year, was like no underperformance. That, that whole underperformance that I started out with was gone. Now, how could that be from a 40-minute videotape? Well, I think you've got to hold this notion of a narrative in mind, and you've got to see the kind of work it does. It kind of, just like it did for me in graduate school, it kind of relaxed me about all the cues that were in that situation. And once I was relaxed, I could really get into the work. I could really get into it and start to enjoy it and love it for its own, in its own right, like the, like the opportunity you want a, a person to have when they come to college. It, w- without that distance, I was always vigilant. Well, what is this gonna, what's going to happen here? What do they really mean here? And I'm having my own dialogue in every situation that, that, that I'm in, and my, and my little brain is overcooked in that situation. Well, that's the same thing happening to these students at Yale. Their little brain is overcooked dealing with, with what, what does it mean? And what, what, you know, can I ever fit in here? And on and on and on and on. And all these stereotypes about me. So it, 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 this, this scenario that they got, this narrative that they got given, uh, kind of opens up the door. And then they pr- pay attention, and they do a little better. And then having done a little better, the threats get even more remote. And then the threats getting even more remote, you pay even more attention uh, to it, and you get better and better. So it's a rec- it starts a recursive process that over time results in an elimination of that underperformance. And in the control group, because there's a randomly assigned control group in this study, which is a beautiful methodological thing enabling you to make a strong inference here, uh, in that control group, it's just the opposite. A negative recursive process starts up. So by the, the end of their third year, there's that huge underperformance gap, which is, of course, affecting life outcomes, life prospects, uh, 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 ev- everything. So I think in some ways I like these studies because the first studies give you, a se- give you a picture of what the process is like. But these studies give you an image of what it's like in real life. And, and they show the power that it is having in, in real life. And that also, at the same time, that it's possible to do simple things which can eliminate this thing or reduce this, this thing in, in big ways. And there are a lot of them that have accumulated now in the literature. Um, there are probably five or six intervention studies like this that show the, the student gain. Uh, and somebody just did a recent meta-analysis of these interventions, and they show that when you do an intervention to reduce stereotype threat on a college campus, and you take minority, I'm going to say black, and tell the story in terms of black students, you put black students in that in college environment that has tried to reduce stereotype threat, they not only do not underperform, they overperform. They perform higher than other students with the same SAT score. 
And that makes a lot of sense. It's a kind of complicated, nuanced argument. But the reason that makes sense is because when they took the SAT, their SAT performance was probably repressed by stereotype threat then. So they were probably students who, uh, by all rights, had a higher SAT score. So you bring them into college and you reduce the stereotype threat pressure further, and they perform higher than other students who got the same SAT score. So that, that, that's what happens, and that's what gives you some sense that, especially in this realm of life, higher education, undergraduate school, graduate school, medical school, law school, these pressures are big. They're not, they're not small. I'm not sure that they explain the achievement gap in inner city uh, uh, grade schools, K through 12, where you've got most of our population back in very racially and class segregated schools, that stereotype threat is the major factor there. There are so many other factors that contribute to underperformance there. Uh, the, just the quality of education, the stress that those communities are under, that the families are under, there's so many things that stack up that would manifest themselves as lower performance and skill. I don't think you have to get to something as nuanced as stereotype threat. But when you're talking about college, where you've selected the survivors of that and who've gotten into college and have great skills, I think this is the bigger, this is the bigger part of the story. That, uh, and certainly when you talk about it, uh, uh, professional training. I think this is the bigger part of the story. Why are no women in STEM fields? I think there's a good reason they're, they're not in STEM fields. I, you know, of course, I'm, you know, forgive me for uh, stating this in a, in, it, with more enthusiasm than is befitting a scientist, but, <laughs> but uh, that's kind of my best guess, is that that's, what, if that's where the real problem is. When women drop out of STEM fields, they don't drop out because their, per their grades are lower. They drop out there's no correlation between whether or not they drop out and their grades in that field. None. For men, of course, there is. You don't do well, you drop out. For women, there's no relationship. Well, I could go on in this vein, but I better stop at this point and see if there are any, any questions. Thank you. <laughs> One's always got to start. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually began sure. touching on this right at the end there, but I, I got curious, uh, looking at your, your only graph. Um, so there must have been, right, underperformance on both the SAT and the GPA. So why do you think it is that the GPA appear, appeared to be responding more to the stereotype threat than the SAT? I, I would have guessed it would be the other way around way your curves are, it suggested that people with the same SAT had lower GPAs. So I yeah, I, I think <laughs> basically underperformance comes from the fact that, that I, I, I think this, I hope this addresses your question. Uh, it comes from the fact that I think when the student takes the SAT, they're under stereotype threat, but then when they get to college, they're also under stereotype threat. So uh, they're, they're so that it's repressed again, that, and that experience suppresses their GPA. So the GPA comes down because of the stereotype threat they're experiencing in the college en environment that brings their uh, SAT down. So in these, in these interventions that do relatively minimal things to take the stereotype threat out of the college situation, observe this huge, this huge uh, gain in, in performance, in a sense, this overperformance in the sense that um, they're doing better than other kids with the same SAT score. I, I'm, I'm not sure. lower GPA because uh, when he went to college, he had all these distracting concerns and no good narrative and, and the, he's probably one of a minority and so boom, boom, boom. All those things repressed his, his performance, his grade performance. And his SAT was also suppressed. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, yes, I mean, I, I, mean, I hope this is the right just to answer you. Right oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. It's a complicated uh, <laughs> conversation we're having here. Uh, I, I, I'll say this, and then maybe we can talk about it uh, uh, later, but I think one of the surprising things to realize is that when these, uh, when minority students go to, to college and they're in a minority, uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of stereotype threat pressure on them. And that further represses their performance. I mean, dramatically depresses their performance. They start out doing pretty well, but then by the end of the first semester, and then it well in, in, immediately in the second semester, their grades and performance are cascading down because they're like one of the participants in the, in the experiment. They're experiencing the frustration of college life with this big stereotype ha uh, hanging over them to interpret their experience, th this frustration in the darkest possible ways that it's confirming a stereotype or that they're going to be seen to confirm the stereotype. And that's going to be true in every interaction they have with other students, with, with the TAs, with professors. And so their whole experience of college, this is one of the big challenges of integration. Their whole experience of, of, of college is laden with this, with this pressure, with this history visiting them in, the, in that situation. So they get more and more alienated, and you see this progress. You see the you see the performance go. Then they don't do as well, and then not doing as well, they get even more alienated, and you get this kind of recur negative recursive process that kind of that, that goes way down below what their abilities are. Even though the SAT performance was also repressed by stereotype threat, this is probably much worse because it's digging them down in, into a hole. And you do something that takes that that changes that situation. Uh, again, like my experience in graduate school is the best ready example, uh, and, and they, they, they pay a little bit more attention, they start to succeed, and, they, and, they, and you start to see a positive uh, recursive process uh, over time. So I, I, I think one of the things to extract from, from, these, uh, from this research is the experience of, of minority students in universities and the experience of women in STEM fields, which is very much like this. It's, it's a, a kind of contending over time in a chronic way with the with these pressures and the effects that that has on interpreting uh, your your experience. You give you give women a difficult. Uh, I remember junior high school giving uh, uh, boys and girls a difficult math test that we knew they they do wouldn't do well on. So you ask the boys at the end of it, well, um, you didn't do well on this test. What do you think? And and the boys all say, well, that was you know it was a stupid test. And and uh, you know I don't think my teacher is that good. And we never even had this material, and you know they, they kind of blow it off. Uh, but the but the girls, the same thing. You you say, well, wh what what happened? And they say, well, you know, maybe I'm not so good at math. And and they, 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 it, the the stereotypes make that interpretation of one's own experience plausible and and and, and reasonable, uh, and that's how it's affecting the personal uh, experience that we tend to think of in our society as impervious to these pressures. But people are in a web of of social content that is driving and influencing the interpretations we make of our uh, experience. Hi, my name is Lakshmi. I'm a student here at University of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I was attempting to raise awareness and create support for the Office of Academic Multicultural Success. And when speaking to white students about services offered to students of color, they were saying, I don't think we should have special services for students of color because we're all equal and I don't see color and we're all one. So I was wondering how can I better explain what things like the Office of Multicultural Ac Academic Success do and then kind of show white students why it's important and why we do need our own sacred safe space. Yeah, boy, that's a good question and, and, and kind of hit the button with me because that is so, you know, when you're my age, you've heard that for so long. <laughs> it's very frustrating, uh, but uh, be, I, you know, in 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 the most big-hearted way, those white students just don't know, just don't understand, just don't get it, and they they don't r they don't really get it articulated to them, and they don't really know um, this aspect of the society that they live in. They haven't had direct experience with it. We live very segregated lives, and they, they just don't have the experience, the, the direct experience to give that any credibility. So it seems like it's a special confession almost. And that uh, it has no real rationale uh, 
uh, on its own. I think that's the basic problem. It reflects the it reflects the degree to which our society is still racially segregated. Uh, I think, and here's why. Here's one of the remedies for that: is that I think the curriculum and the knowledge that come from ethnic studies programs uh, that have existed, uh, you know, for the last 50 years in in high school that they should be general education requirements. That this is one of the major uh, opportunities we have as institutions of higher education is to inform our citizens of the kind of society that we live in, the kinds of experiences, the range of experiences that people have in this society and the, the history that, br that brings us to this point. It should not be possible for uh, people to consider themselves fully educated and have no conception, no good conception of the tremendous variation in the experience of American society. Is there something That's I could I have said in that moment? <laughs> no? <laughs> well, I think you could say something like I just said. <laughs> <laughs> I, and good luck. Good luck. <laughs> God, God bless you. <laughs> um, thank you, Dr. Steele, for your work. Um, your last book is excellent. You quote um, one scholar calling it a concentration of factors. Uh, Goodlad calls it an array of factors that impact students of color in these situations. Since we sit in the middle of an institution, my question is how do you get the institution to take responsibility for what it has created? Because these issues are so complex and often so subtle that they only become visible or obvious when a student dares to speak up. And when a student dares to speak up, then that student is considered the antagonist, not the system around them. Mm -hmm. So that what usually happens, because a student can't sustain themselves alone, is that the students will either leave, drop out, or quit. So the institution stays intact. If the student compromises enough, then they can stay inside the institution, and that student is used as an example for the rest of the students who fail as if that person is the norm, when in fact they are the exception. So my question is, how do we get the institution, including leadership from the top down, to take responsibility for what we work within as an institution? This is not just U of O. This is our 4J school system. This is most institutions of uh, educational institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, if I, if, uh, if I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would certainly say it, um, and I suspect your guesses are pretty close, going to be as good as mine for, uh, for the most part. I, I, I share with you a desire to have that kind of awareness and that, um, uh, th that the leadership of these institutions would be much more committed to these, these kinds of things. It is, it is frustrating to be here at my advanced age at 65. Uh, and having and remember that as I began my academic career over 40 years ago, uh, there were people. You could, the comments you made would be just as appropriate then as it, as it is now. And though we have made progress, we have made progress. Uh, we haven't really uh, joined in and and uh, done what we could do, and that's a disappointment. Um, and I, I, uh, I hope that, you know, so you, you, you soldier on, I suppose. You soldier on and you do what you can, what you can do from where you are. Um, and, and I, I would, as, as I say that, I think, you know, if we were sitting in the cafe and I was talking to you, uh, brother to brother, um, I, I would say, uh, don't let that interfere with you. Let that interfere with you as less, uh, the, the, you know, least that you can get away with. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you cannot put your life on hold while institutions think. You have to find a way to uh, seize the opportunity that's there. And, and uh, I, I believe very strongly in that. Both things are, both commitments have to be there. Uh, you, you don't want to ever fall into that trap of uh, waiting for a perfect world. I, I work in a K-12 system, and my question, I'm curious about the narrative. And 
is there a distinction among where or who that narrative comes from to make a, a, a larger impact? Where does the narrative come from? In, in, in you thinking maybe like in a K through 12 context? What I'm wondering is, is there a difference in, I'm over here. Oh, you're there. I see, I was <laughs> looking oh. <about laughs> so, Something Thank wasn't you. matching up. <laughs> I was thinking, where's the sound coming from? So I'm just wondering in terms of, uh, the, the narrative just really struck me and I was curious. And, and we always try to have conversations with students, most certainly, mm -hmm. but is there a difference from where that narrative comes from in terms uh, of making a larger impact yeah. on, on a, a student? Yeah, I, that's a very good question because I think one of the ingenious things of that, that study that I described of the, of the Yale students is that they had the idea to have the narrative come from another student who's, who's just a little bit older than them. That's who students are really listening to about these things, about the world that they're in. Uh, and so I, I, I think there's a big insight in that, that the, 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 uh, the narrative can be uh, effective when, especially effective when it comes from, from uh, friends and, and from students and maybe from family. That's another big source of, of, of narratives. I think families have a huge role in, in giving people an understanding of the situation that, that they're in, that while, wha like the last speaker, a lot that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's a truth, there has to be some room in that narrative. Uh, for a person to still feel empowered in the situation. And families can do that, teachers can do that, everybody can contribute to that, e e even as I think we listen an awful lot to uh, people our, in our own age group. Yeah. Well, I think my question um, follows on that wonderful question. First of all, I want to thank you for this amazing research. It's so important that we discuss it. And I just wanted to know, what are the implications of these findings uh, when it comes to diversity and faculty retention? Well, uh, I, th I think that um, these findings, I hope, uh, help us know how to do it better. Uh, I, I, that's, that's certainly one of the ambitions of the research is to understand the nature of some of the things that, that discourage it and that press against it. And by understanding those things, to, to design strategies uh, for overcoming it and for making, making it uh, more effective. So uh, the, the, the two directions I point in, sort of institutional things that can be done around the, the cues and the uh, leadership and the, the way leaders and teachers frame the experience. Uh, we, we have so many uh, teachers inside a university who have no regard for the question. And, and, and do not make any effort to or, or know how to frame uh, their instruction in an inclusive way uh, 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 that give narratives that are, that are hopeful and that deal with the question, these questions openly. So, so we're, we're, we're trying to move big you know, ocean liners mm -hmm. uh, to, to change their direction. And I think also um, uh, we need, this, this is something that, that I think we don't do enough of, but, but to uh, help um, you know, faculty and students who are trying to thrive in these institutions uh, have good narratives, have narratives of the sort that, that I'm, I'm trying to describe that are realistic, but at the same time hopeful, mm -hmm. and uh, acknowledge the challenges, but at the same time offer hope that they're not gonna be completely foreclosed from. That's the, that's the recipe that I, I think we need to, needs to begin to affect that, that language. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, um, my name's Kevin Houghton, and um, I just first of all, thank you for coming and uh, speaking here at the University of Oregon. Um, I was uh, wondering actually about your research. I actually hadn't heard this up in Portland, but I definitely plan to. Um, so That's what I'd love to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, so uh, you mentioned like Inglewood High School that you did a lot of your tests there. Was that correct? I'm actually a Los Angeles native, oh, um, uh -huh. so um, I was just wondering if you were uh, primarily doing, um, you know, along racial lines, or if you were doing along socioeconomical lines also mm -hmm. with doing it like at Inglewood because at Inglewood High School, I wondered if you had like done it in any other areas also, just just to see yeah. what the like mm -hmm. implications were comparatively. Yeah. To, like, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, 
you know, I'm kind of familiar with the LA Unified School District and what they do if a mm-hmm. school is underperforming. Mm-hmm. But you know, they put less money into, you know, s- you know, uh, schools if they if they don't perform at a certain level. Mm-hmm. So, um, did you notice that you know schools like Inglewood, you know, if they were underperforming, did did you notice that you know that the results were lower there? Oh, uh, y- you know, we weren't looking at, at, okay. at just average yeah. performances. Mm-hmm. We were doing that. That uh, puzzle, no puzzle. Yeah, on, on the IQ test, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we were doing that puzzle, no puzzle mm-hmm. study, and we, we divided students into, we pre measured how, how strongly identified they were with school, how, how much, how important mm-hmm. performing well in school was to their sense of themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, the for the students that said performing in school well is not a, a big part of my, my life, they, sh- they didn't show any effect of mm-hmm. whether the test was a puzzle or, or not. But for the students that did say school was very important to me, they did show good effects. So we, w- we were looking at that kind of comparison as opposed to looking at the overall performance of kids in, in, in Inglewood High School. Uh, but most, uh, mo- you know, now the research has been done, uh, you know, over the world, like, like in, in the studies in, on, on race, just like the Inglewood study. Um, a lot of them have been done in France on social class because social class is a lot more similar uh, to the way we think of race, social class is thought of as, as like that in France, mm-hmm. and you get the same kind of, uh, of, of, of results there. I don't know if, if people have done social class studies in the United States. I don't either, but yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I have a question. I thought a psychologist like yourself uh, might be able to answer. I've read that uh, black and white show no difference in self-esteem level. And it doesn't make any sense to me because of the negative messages that blacks are continually getting in the society. Do you have an explanation about why there's no difference in level of self-esteem? Between whites and blacks? Yeah, that's what I've read in articles, in psychology yeah. articles. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of um, bases for self-esteem, and because the larger society may have you negatively stereotyped in some basic ways, does not mean that you don't have other options from which you can build self-esteem. Uh, and um, I think that's true for for uh, for many groups that maybe experience stigma, but when you actually measure their global self-esteem, it's pretty high. Uh, and it's because it's based on a variety of other things. Uh, be a good person in lots of ways. You can be a great athlete. You can be um, a great um, organizer of, of people in the community. You can, I mean, there's just a lot of ways. You can be a good gang member and, g- and <laughs> have that be the basis of self-esteem. I mean, self-esteem has a lot of, a lot of bases. So because one, I- one source of self-esteem is kind of, uh, you know, squeezed out for, uh, uh, for a group doesn't mean that the group doesn't have other options for building self-esteem. So it does seem uh, uh, surprising that blacks and other groups who suffered negative stereotypes have have high self-esteem. It's, it seems su- uh, surprising because you think that condition is so all-encompassing en- that it would just bring down global self-esteem. But apparently it isn't. Uh, and, that, and that people, when you can't build self-esteem in, in one domain because it's very difficult, you start to find other do- domains. And in the black community, there's a long tradition of dealing with this experience of being uh, stigmatized in the larger society. There's a lot of in-group support and uh, a lot of uh, uh, sources of, of self-regard for wi- within the group. It's, it's had a long uh, history of evolving ways of, uh, of, of maintaining self-esteem. So uh, on second thought, it's not that surprising. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, work. It's oh. been been so important, I think, uh, across the nation, but certainly in a context like we have here at the University of Oregon, this sort of predominantly white um, state and university context. So uh, in, in my experience, the, the importance of it in terms of formative research is compelling. But moreover, what strikes me is how malleable this process is. Mm-hmm. And so it's ripe for intervention. Mm-hmm. The experimental studies show that s- really small, very discrete things can be done to disrupt what is in fact a very deep and for many people lifelong 
on processes of, of experiencing stereotyping threat. So I'm interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about what's malleable, and particularly you, you mentioned critical mass mm -hmm. and the role that critical mass plays. This is not something that we're unfamiliar with um, here as a, as a source of both effort but also controversy at the University of Oregon. Mm -hmm. so, so what role does critical mass play in disrupting the process of stereotyping threat um, mm -hmm. more specifically? Mm -hmm. and, and where's the tipping point in terms of critical mass? Mm -hmm. Boy, uh, I, I have a, a, a riff on, on uh, that, how, how impres you know, who, who said that, that you know po pornography when you see it? You know, I can't remember what justice famously said that, but uh, what was it? Brennan said that. Uh, but um, you'll know critical mass when you see it. <laughs> uh, it's, it you know, Sandra Day O'Connor experienced critical mass as just one female justice joining the, the bench. Uh, but you'd never say you could have three uh, women in the STEM you know, in STEM fields, and, and, and that would be a sufficient critical mass. And, and so, so how many would make it, I, I don't know. There's sort of some psychological uh, number that, 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 that suggests that there the contingencies that exist here in this situation tied to my identity are not so bad and foreclosing as to prevent me from being there. I think there's, th when, the, when, the num when the numbers of people send that signal, uh, then you got critical mass. So, that, and that's an easy, I know, glib way to get, to get around it, but I don't really have a better answer to, to that uh, question. But I, I do think in, in relation to your general point about these things being modifiable, there are a lot of strategies that seem to work. Uh, how, to give, how does a white professor give feedback to a, a, a critical feedback to a black student and have that feedback be uh, taken seriously? Uh, uh, the, the answer is very simple. You do just basically what my advisor did for me. You, you, you demand a lot and you support their ability to affirm their ability to uh, meet, reach those demands. Uh, it's not tough love, it's, it's demanding love. It's demanding love, it's support. What you, what you really do with somebody you're taking seriously. So in, in, those in, in that kind of relationship, that's something that, that really works. We had a, uh, an intervention at the University of Michigan uh, years ago where we had undergraduates uh, have integrated in, in groups that were integrated in, in the portions that were just put together in the same ethnic proportions that existed on the campus at large. Um, 15 groups of students, maybe, maybe three, four would be black, and um, uh, maybe a couple Latino at the time uh, and, at, and in Ann Arbor, and they would talk about personal things. Uh, parents, fraternities, sororities, money, uh, what their careers were, all these kinds of things. And they'd get together every Thursday night. We'd give them pizza and donuts and horrible things that they loved. <laughs> they'd come and they'd have these conversations. And it, was, it had a huge impact, impact on, the, uh, on the minority students. Uh, it, it told them that their troubles that they had were not, it gave them an evi evidential basis for realizing that the troubles they had were not entirely due to their race because everybody was having troubles. And they could see that. Whereas if you're having these personal conversations, which segregation tends to force you to have, only with members of your own group, you can entertain the idea that the bad things are just happening to you because of your, of, of your identity, of your group. Uh, but as soon as that conversation starts to, to go across those boundaries, you get a different evidential basis for interpreting the situation you're in, for, for the kind of narrative you have of the situation that, uh, that, that you're in. So that was an intervention uh, that worked. Uh, another one is having the, is, is underscoring the idea that ability, academic ability, is expandable and incremental, as opposed to God-given and genetic-given and fixed. You know, this is the Carol Dweck uh, uh, argument, mindset ar ar argument, having a growth mindset. And, and as, far as, as far as the scientific basis for an idea is concerned, the growth mindset is much more rooted in science than the fixed uh, idea that we have as a piece of our cultural ideology that, that you know, some people are just smart. When you actually deconstruct that, uh, you find the people that seem to be really smart have had some, from Mozart on, this, is in, uh, this, this work has been done with prodigies of, 
of, of all sorts. It, they've had some early and peculiar exposure to the domain. And so by the time that they're age mates and they engage each other in the domain, they're so far ahead, everybody says they're just zooms. Because they can't seem to explain it. And what's, and what's not visible is this time parenting often, you know, sort of the Tiger Woods phenomenon where his father's out there, he's, you know, 18 months old and he's seeing golf tapes and swinging golf clubs and, and so by the time he encounters kids at seven, he's so much better than they are, they think, well, this is natural at this. So uh, the idea that ability is, is expandable, that the brain is the most expandable organ that, that we have, makes the stereotypes about your group less, and, and being possibly judged in terms of them, makes them less impactful. Because uh, the stereotype is alleging you have a fixed and categorical sense of limitation. Dastardly thing about these stereotypes about ability. Uh, they're not playing around. They're not saying, oh, you just didn't work hard. They're saying you're dumb and you're limited. And uh, so uh, if you can privately, I've, I've always had this view personally. I have to uh, uh, admit this. I've always, I, even though I'm going to graduate school and the professors and the other students are all talking about who's really smart and, you know, who's really got it, who's really, really, really got it. Um, and uh, I'm saying to myself, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I, b I believe I, I could get it. And that, that's what, so having that belief system helps you resist some of these uh, uh, pressures, and that can be fostered programmatically uh, uh, as, as students come into uh, to s to schools like these. So I, I think there are a sort of set of things that, that are available that uh, – the people who have made it a lot of had a lot of impact with just plain self affirmations, allowing people to uh, take a minute and write down the things that are most important and meaningful to them in their lives. Just do that. What really is important to you? And as soon as you remind yourself of that, all those cues—the fact that the guy is using the N word and the fact that they're talking about race and IQ—all all those cues in the situation just become less important. And people can pay more attention to what they're doing, and they do better, and they get some space that way. There are certain rules that people use. Jim Comer uses a three strikes rule. He tells his mi minority students in, 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 uh, in his grade schools that, that where he has such success that, look, uh, the first time you think that you're being discriminated against because of your race, ignore it. The second time you think you're being discriminated against because of your race, ignore it. The third time, don't ignore it. But you can see just when you hear that, when you hear that idea, you can see the kind of space that would gi give you. I don't have to worry about this for the for for w let, let this let this situation go if you can really do it. Let the situation unfold for a little bit because the probabilities are that it wasn't. You know, life is complicated. People do things for all and say things for all kinds of reasons, and and oftentimes what just happened to you had nothing to do with race. Sometimes it did, but be patient here. It's it's worth you. To to err in that direction, that it is to, it's better to err in that direction than it is to err in the direction of this sort of hypervigilance. So that's another frame of mind that can be very effective in, um, in reducing these, these pressures and that I think can be offered uh, programmatically. If we know that these are the pressures that are, are critical in this underperformance, we, we can have these effects. The thing is that, uh, that when, as soon as we go out to the faculty and as soon as we go out to the, to the the larger culture about these things, these problems of underperformance are not interpreted like I'm interpreting them. These problems are interpreted in terms of lack of ability. And that probably if we want to get, get rid of underperformance or something like that, whatever you say it is, uh, Professor Steele, uh, what we got to do is get our s selection standards higher and bring in students who are more prepared to do this complicated, difficult uh, work that we offer at this uh, high, it's almost a self-flattering uh, explanation. I've always had the view, and uh, this will sound weird, it's not that hard to get good grades in college. It's usually, it's usually the, the biggest difficulty is that the, ki the people who come to college at a, are at a certain developmental stage in life where being organized is really difficult. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I, I, I almost flunked out of college when I went to uh, when I went to college. I didn't know what to do. I just didn't know how to do it. I had a roommate, thank God, and the guy 
uh, showed me how to go to college. And, and the first thing he said is, look, man, uh, you got to go to class. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, a second thing is, you know, it would help if you at least skim the chapter before you went to class. And, and so I started doing those things, and then college got to be easy <laughs> and kind of fun. So I, I, I think a lot of what we're interpreting as big deficiencies, you know, 200 points on an SAT score, we're using that as evidence that we're talking about massive deficiencies. Well, these things are irrelevant. It's the, 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 the more fundamental thing is that we're dealing with people at a certain developmental age, and, and we need to. So I, if we had this other frame, that it's, it's not the ability so much, but it's the kind of environment that we that we uh, 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 create for these students. It's the kind of ideologies that we give them to understand the experience that they're, that they're in, uh, to, to understand the routes that, they, that, that lead to success. I think we can have a massive effect on these things. Some families are really good at telling their kids how to go to college and what the whole damn thing is about. And some families don't have a clue what to say about it. And, and, and that we're dealing with that kind of variation in, in, in the students that, that come to us. And I think if we would get, if we just sort of accept the importance of these other things, we could just be infinitely more effective as, as educators. So I've got to warn you out. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>